So, uh, so as the only card-carrying immunologist uh, in the in the um, show today, I thought I should take you through a few things. And partly, it's going to be important understanding what we've done and and the clues that we've developed in terms of this thesis of, of is this an autoimmune disease? Why why do we think that? What's what's the evidence? And and for that, you really just uh, I just want to take you briefly through the immune system because it is complicated. Um, some people black out when they start hearing about the immune system and, uh, and its complications, but it's, it's getting simpler all the time, which is, uh, that means we're understanding it and we can reduce it to uh, just a few statements. Like, there are a bunch of white blood cells that do different things and they have names and functions. And they talk to each other with cytokines. So key ingredient in the immune system, different white blood cells, talking to each other with different cytokines, uh, coordinating activities. But at the end of the day, it's the individual cells and whatever it is they're supposed to do that, that uh, make things happen. Uh, we generally think of the immune system as two components, although they're, they're, they interact as well. Uh, there's the innate immune system, which is sort of the fast acting, oh my God, something's happened. Uh, you know, there's, I'm bleeding. Um, Let's have some inflammation so we can get more white blood cells into the inflamed part, the injured part. And it can be injured through uh, with just a, a wound uh, or um, more often uh, uh, an infectious disease is, is coming in. Uh, and then a little while later, you can get this adaptive immune system to kick in, which are the lymphocytes. And uh, lymphocytes are making these very, very specific uh, receptors that essentially are uh, the body's solution to our intense evolutionary problem with respect to viruses and bacteria and pathogens, which is that um, they can replicate sometimes every 20 minutes. We replicate only every 20 years. So there's no way we can win an evolutionary race, you know, if we start at the same point. So we cheat, and we cheat by making every possible receptor against things that we've never even seen before. And uh, maybe they have just evolved on Mars uh, a week ago and then they come in and, and, and there you are. But you already have antibodies and T cells specific for those. So how does that happen? Uh, that's uh, one of the remarkable things about the immune system is that it creates diversity at the gene level. It's the, the genes for antibodies and T cell receptors are split up into pieces and where there are many alternative components. It's like an old Chinese uh, restaurant menu. You can pick one from column A and one from column B, one from column C at the genetic level. And then these come together in the chromosome, in the DNA, fused together, very specific mechanisms. And at the end of the day, then you have billions of possible um, sequences just in those bits of the molecules, the big proteins that are responsible, are the business end, are binding to whatever it is they, they might want to bind, which is sort of every possible thing. Uh, and some of the numbers are, are pretty uh, amazing. As I say, uh, when you put all these things together, both T cells and B cells, you, you get very large numbers, billions and trillions of possible combinations um, just because of the way it's put together. Um, and, um, and this all happens at the DNA level. And once it happens, it's irreversible, it stops. In fact, the whole machinery for rearrangement gets activated during certain times in a response or in development. And then once it happens, it stops. And once you have a good antibody gene or a good T cell receptor gene, the whole recombination process stops. And then that is what that cell has. But the cell next door has another one. And the one in the whole crowd will, will be expressing uh, billions of, of possible variations. Uh, now, let me throw another uh, complication at you, which is um, that's the story for antibodies, and it's also the story for T cell receptor genes. But T cells are a little trickier than antibodies in the sense that they're actually recognizing peptides. You just heard about poisonous peptides. These are uh, just regular peptides that have been degraded out of whole proteins. And, but it's also the beauty of the system is that every protein gets degraded whether it's a protein that belongs in your cell or whether it comes from a pathogen or a virus. So there's not any good way in which the pathogen or virus could disguise 
the shape of its peptide, or it can disguise the shape of its proteins, but once the protein gets degraded into peptides, it, it no longer has the ability to fool the immune system's detection system. Um, and so that's where T cells come in because they are uh, recognizing little peptides that are stuck in this big molecule that has often been uh, described as a moose uh, head. And uh, the T cell receptor on the T cell is on, uh, uh, coming down and, and contacting this, this combination of a little peptide and, and this moose-like uh, MHC structure. And then between cells, uh, which I can barely see, but uh, you, can, you can see a, um, a representation of a T cell receptor uh, recognizing a particular peptide MHC. Uh, there are other complications, including that we have ways in which we can look at peptides that are made within a cell and peptides that are made, um, that, that are coming from proteins outside the cell. Uh, but let's, um, I think, move on to the other key thing about basic immunology that you, I want you to realize is um, that what, how does this whole thing work? If you're making billions of possible specificities, how does that actually do anything? Or don't you get lost in all the, uh, the, the complexity of that? Uh, or don't the cells get in each other's way? In the, each other's way? Uh, no, because what happens is that, that a whole collection of T cells is expressing these billions of possible T cell receptors, but only one that has a receptor that can recognize, in this case, a specific virus, uh, is stimulated enough to trigger cell division. And that cell division then makes a whole bunch of daughter cells, uh, representing there, um, that all have the same DNA rearrangement for that receptor, and therefore they all have the same specificity. So this is the amplifier mechanism. This, is, this was a, a big deal discovered 60 some years ago in immunology, uh, and it's, uh, it's a way you, you pull out the T cells or, or B cells from the crowd that have just the specificity that you need for whatever the pathogen is or whatever the stimulus is. Uh, now, as uh, Dr. Light said earlier, uh, the system makes mistakes. And sometimes uh, if you make a response against, say, a virus, there can be a cross-reactivity to self proteins. And that can sometimes uh, trigger autoimmunity, that, that you start off making a perfectly reasonable response against a particular virus. But if things go wrong and um, there's a similarity between that viral peptide or protein and something in your heart muscle, for example, uh, you can have a serious autoimmunity to your heart, you can have serious autoimmunity to your joints, to, to every, you know, various tissues. Uh, juvenile diabetes is autoimmunity to your uh, insulin-producing cells in the pancreas. So there are lots and lots of... Um, uh, problems where, where things have, have gone wrong. So let me take you through the, the chronic fatigue data, um, and, and I'll be referring back to some of these things. Uh, one, one just is uh, just recently in, uh, published in uh, PNAS, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, largely the work of Jose Montoya. I, I helped, but, but it's really his study. Uh, he looked at almost 600 people, 200 chronic fatigue patients, and um, almost 400 controls, uh, age and, and sex match, and uh, at, for a lot of immune biomarkers, uh, particularly cytokines in this study. He's also looking at other biomarkers, but this is the, the sort of first tranche of this uh, a very large study. And I could say that, he, um, that this study was funded solely through philanthropy. Um, and that's our big problem, as, as Ron has mentioned, uh, in terms of getting the attention. We finally did get the attention of NIH, and they are finally putting more uh, serious money than they have before into this sort of thing. But it takes time, and for um, areas that are not well understood, there's a tendency to dismiss them, to uh, ignore, you know, hope it goes away, not going away, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but um, uh, one thing philanthropy can do that NIH has trouble doing, NIH relies on peer review. And peer review means that they assemble a jury of people that have apparently the same skills and knowledge as the person applying for the grant. 
uh, which it works pretty well in areas that are well understood and there's a clear path forward. Um, in areas that are not well understood and there's no clear path forward and typically massive confusion, um, just imagine Elon Musk going and applying for a grant from uh, Detroit 10 years ago to start Tesla. That's kind of uh, somewhat analogous to uh, where we are now is that, um, you know, we've got, we, there's, there's um, confusion and then there's no consensus and, and um, uh, so forth and so on. So anyway, long story short is uh, that in this study, uh, we saw a remarkably of 51 cytokines that, that we can follow in the serum of chronic fatigue patients, uh, 17 were elevated and they're largely weighted towards inflammatory cytokines. And they also uh, correlated, as I hope you can see here, uh, we're looking at mild, medium, and severe uh, patients, uh, ill patients. And what you can see in every case, there's a progression from uh, uh, mild uh, having a lower levels to medium higher and then uh, severe even, even higher than that. So this really says that there's uh, a lot of inflammation going on. And inflammation takes various forms and means various things, some of which we we're, I think we're still understanding, but this is definitely an indicator of, um, of inflammation, of some kind of systemic inflammation, and that uh, this is typically coming from the innate immune system. Uh, but we're interested, we uh, have done a lot of work on T cells, and uh, we're particularly interested in whether there's a, a T or B cell role in this, and something we could trace back which you can't with ties, do with cytokines, but you can trace back uh, with B cells and T cells because the uh, receptors are so specific. And this depend partly on a, a novel assay that we developed at Sanford a couple years ago where we can sequence at a single cell level, we can get uh, T cell receptor sequences from any patient, any tissue, um, any, any disease you care to look at. And one of the things that, um, came up very quickly in this, looking uh, first just at some uh, uh, T cells in cancer. So in many cancers, uh, T cells infiltrate and proliferate within the tumor, and, and they uh, often are specific for antigens in those tumors. So one thing we've seen here very clearly in this uh, colon carcinoma, uh, there are a lot of T cells, and by, this, by sequence analysis, we can tell that for instance, there's 60 different T cells from this tumor that all have the same T cell receptor in red here, and then about 40 that all have this blue one, and so forth. But what you can see is that uh, all, more than half of the T cells in this tumor uh, have expanded clonally. That is, there's something there that triggered cell division, uh, and that's why you're getting the same T cell receptor. Whereas in adjacent tissue from the same patient, there's almost no clonal expansion. So something's happening within the tumor. Uh, we've also seen this in uh, a mouse model of uh, MS, where um, kind of a classic model where as, as you induce the disease, you see uh, clonal expansions of uh, T cells uh, with, uh, with the different days, and both in the blood and in the central nervous system. And um, that's also uh, CD8 cells. We also looked at MS patients uh, in a collaboration with a group at UCSF. And here, uh, also in, in control healthy uh, subjects, we see almost no CD8 clonal expansion. But in almost all of the MS patients, we see massive T cell clonal expansion in, in the blood. So we can look in the blood, we can see evidence of, of really strong um, uh, T cell uh, proliferation and division, which we associate with uh, specific responses. Similarly, in Lyme disease, we have a, another study in Lyme disease. Uh, we see the same, uh, same thing, especially, in, again, in, uh, sorry, CD8 cells. That's not CD8 cells. Those, those are the CD8 cells. So you just see a lot of clonal expansion. So, uh, so this was one of our first things to look at in terms of chronic fatigue. And particularly, we started looking at it because in, in work with Jose Montoya, we found that uh, we look at T cell receptor sequences from CFS patients, we see a lot of similar T cell receptor sequences shown by these dots here, and not random like these um, similarities here in, in, in controls um, and so forth. So that indicated there are some specific T cells there. And so we dug deeper. Uh, we looked at six uh, patients which had particular 
uh, HLA types, and uh, we, we put our uh, methodology to work. We ended up sequencing about 1,000 uh, individual T cells, and sure enough, um, the CD8 cells from all of these patients showed evidence of, of a marked clonal expansion, that something's going on that's stirring these cells up, and particularly there's an antigen, almost certainly an antigen-triggered event that is um, causing them to divide. Uh, there could be multiple antigens, but there, there certainly are some more than normal. So um, in summary of all this, I showed you, um, uh, I did, I, not here uh, cancer, but uh, in cancer, in uh, infectious diseases, in autoimmunity, and in chronic fatigue, uh, characteristic is, is CD8 clonal T cell expansion. And at least in some cases, we know those are specific for the disease. So we also have now gone on with these T cell receptors to uh, look for the antigen. And here we're collaborating with uh, Marvin uh, G and Chris Garcia because they have a nice uh, yeast display system to find the antigens. And uh, so far we have just one uh, hit out of the first couple of T cell receptors and, and we're working that up to try to understand what's, what's the antigen and, and does that mean, uh, does that indicate some particular um, antigen, some particular pathogen, some particular tissue, or both, which is sort of what we would expect. If it's an autoimmune disease, you'd expect to see that this originally was against some pathogen uh, peptide, and, but it, that it cross-reacts with um, uh, some self peptide. Maybe in the microglia, maybe, you know, maybe somewhere else. So, so anyway, this is uh, this is where we are right now. We we see evidence of, of really major activity in terms of inflammatory cytokines in the blood, very reproducibly. If chronic fatigue patients, there's a correlation with disease severity. So we know something's stirring up the innate immune system. Um, it could be a pathogen. It could be some sort of uh, auto-inflammatory uh, thing, which that's not that well understood. But uh, what it also could be is part of a whole immune response uh, that involves T cells as well as innate immune system. And T cells make a lot of cytokines, and they could make some of those cytokines. Uh, but particularly what I think is most exciting about this sort of line of approach is that if we know more about the specificity of these CD8 T cells that we're seeing expanding, uh, it could lead us directly to a pathogen that might be the precipitator of the disease and also uh, autoimmune uh, peptides that could tell us more about um, the kinds of uh, pathological effects that uh, uh, people are seeing in, in this disease. So uh, that's, our, that's our hope and uh, our mission and uh, we have many uh, people to thank, uh, particularly though uh, most of this work is done by uh, Santosh Kumar and Elsa Sola, uh, postdocs in lab uh, with help from uh, many others, including uh, Connor uh, Gaijin, and uh, lots of great collaborators, including Ron and uh, Jose Montoya and others. So, thank you.